Hi guys, uh, welcome to our panel on the future of the crypto exchange. Uh, today we're going to be digging into the exchange model a little bit, talking about the bear market, uh, changing user profiles and how attitudes to incentivization, DeFi and derivatives are really shaping Web3 at the moment. Uh, so I'd like to bring on my panelists, so if you guys want to join me on the stage. Great, so I'll just quickly whip through an introduction and then we can jump into the questions. Uh, so we have James West, who's uh, CEO of Globe, joining us. Um, you guys can clap for each person if you like. <laughs> I appreciate the boops. Awesome, you have to clap equally loudly for everyone. Uh, we also have Diego Clerk, who's VIP and Institutional Sales Manager at Binance. Michaela Silvestri, who's part of the institutional unit at Huboy Global. Uh, Lee Aswell, who I believe, oh, is actually sat next to me here, uh, who you just heard from, uh, from Swapsicle, a co-founder. Uh, and finally, that martini guy, or Jordan. Um, oh, I had a great way to introduce you. Investor, YouTuber, and founder of the Crypto Savings Expert. There we go. Uh, awesome. So, um, I'm going to kick off with the first question. Uh, so, we're in the midst of the bear market, and we're seeing kind of user numbers decrease as well as uh, people transacting less. Um, what products or features have you seen work well in the bear market that is still kind of driving revenue? Um, Diego, maybe you want to kick us off? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll take the first bullet, all right. Um, so we, we have definitely seen a decrease in volatility in the, in the bear, bear market, uh, but I think year on year for Binance, um, the, the volume is just doubling. So from last year, uh, we did about $10, tri $10 trillion in, in yearly volume. This year, we, we already passed that, and we're, we're, in the, we're in the path to build a $20 trillion year in volume. So I think uh, in terms of products and, and features, Trading is still the strongest line for, for Binance revenues. Uh, but we have been focusing on building other lines of revenue as well. Uh, mostly on the institutional side, we build a custody product. Uh, OTC lending is quite popular lately uh, among the, the meltdown that happened later uh, earlier this year. Um, and then obviously, we, there is, on, on the other front, there is uh, the NFT marketplace that we built uh, around the last year. Uh, which is uh, on path to beat the traded volume on OpenSea at the moment. So it's second to largest NFT marketplace. Great, thanks. Um, Michaela, would you say that's the same over at Huboy, or how is it different for you? Um, I would say for us, has been, there have been three products rising mass massively. The first would be Huobi Earn, which is basically our staking product. Um, it has a hybrid nature. Um, basically, um, it's the first DeFi product that we have on the exchange. Uh, we offer up to 40% um, APY on some coins, and that has been uh, tremendously successful, even in bear market. The second one would be crypto loans. Quick notes here, our loans are fully collateralized. Um, um, and the third one will be futures. Uh, we do, uh, we, we saw a substantial rise in uh, futures in the last month because of the Ethereum um, uh, event. And regardless of how weird the, the market is still, um, we, we do have quite a, a demand for this product. Our institutional clients, 80% of them are fully uh, focused on futures. So those three will be the key ones. Great. And um, Lee, is there any difference over in Swap School in terms of growth? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, for us, um, with the DeFi, obviously, grenade that went off in this market with, I'm not going to name names, but trust is missing within the space. So for us at Swap School, it was all about being transparent with the products that we bring into market as a number one priority. So we're bringing a single sided layer one staking contract to market with like rates of up to 30% on layer one assets. But what we're doing, we're not going to use our assets to actually um, pay those rewards, to enable those rewards. We're actually going to load those assets into the smart contract so it's actually visible on chain to build that trust up with our community. Because I believe after some of the grenades that have gone off in the last market, I think trust takes time to rebuild again. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And actually, if you want to hold the mic, because I might come back to you for the next question. Uh, so we talked about futures and potentially also trust being key for kind of growing markets uh, in centralized and decentralized areas. Um, would you say there are any, any other key areas that exchanges specifically are helping support the development of the Web3 ecosystem? 
Um, what exchange support? As in, like, how are exchanges kind of shaping the space? Ah, right, okay, cool. So from a decentralised point of view for us, like I said, we go back to trust. But then collaboration and good kind of actors within the space are driving forth the development journey. So we try to encourage our community or future leaders to actually come to us with ideas so we can help them, we can put them into contact with people. Because at the end of the day, my inbox is always open and I try to help the others around us because I believe if we collaborate and we grow together, all the boats rise together. Great, uh, and James, would you add anything to this? Uh, yeah, in, in, in two words, uh, we, we invest fundamentally. And, and so one, one is we cycle a small percentage of revenue into helping to build out, I think, the world that we feel that we want to live in. Two is that we, we invest our own engineering resources to help projects, and so that can be in the form of just taking people that haven't built matching engines before and <laughs> helping them to architect you know, what is a semi-sold but very fundamentally kind of technically complex system. Um, and, and thirdly, we, you know, we regularly get asked to advise, and we do so freely, we don't sell tokens. <laughs> yeah. I think as an industry as, as a whole, you know, the, the exchange industry does play a key role in helping to safeguard its, its customers away from potentially kind of damaging and, and dangerous projects. And that, that is very tricky. Um, it has to carefully guard itself about being overly parasitic in, in the ways that it does that. So you see exchanges taking very large fees in the form of both cash and also tokens, and often with you know, vesting schedules that are not in favor of the long-term growth of the project. And so we, you know, all we can really do individually is to push against practices that we think are gonna push down good projects. Um, I will add to that. Um, I think that exchanges are now um, impacting Web 3.0 across their investment arms. In the case of Huobi, we have three investment arms at the moment. We have Huobi Ventures, we have a one billion fund with Iberblocks, and then we have Huobi um, Incubator. In Huobi Incubator, we, we give massive grants to early stage investors, to early stage entrepreneurs. Uh, while Huobi Ventures, we make sure that we build a whole ecosystem for the project. Um, we, from the go-to-market strategy to, to, to token economics, contact with VCs, and direct listing. Um, and I think that we not only take the approach of the investment arm, but also we take the bet into DeFi with our chain, with Huobi chain, which is basically um, a highly perform performing infrastructure for digital assets. And this is very similar to BNB as well. So I think that Binance is also- Yeah, that's right. right. I think we built a pretty strong case scenario for the last five years with BNB chain and Binance Smart Chain um, being um, one of the top chains that on, on DeFi development. Um, BNB is not just a token that belongs to Binance, it's a, it's a whole organization and foundation behind it. Um, they incentivize a community, they incentivize DeFi protocols and, and so on. So yeah, I think um, we're we're going to keep seeing a lot more of uh, tokenis, tokens incentivizing by exchanges, uh, large, largely played by, by large exchanges like Huobi or Binance. Okay, and um, Jordan, I mean, you obviously not sitting in an exchange in the same way as these guys. Like, what's your take on, on this, the role that exchanges are playing in kind of shaping the space? I think that for the most part, there are a lot of... I'm not really... Exchanges are focused on profit at the end of the day. They hire staff, they have a lot of people that work for them. And ultimately, they need to impress their shareholders and make the largest profit possible. That's the job of an exchange. My job is looking at that business model and understanding, look, how can I best benefit that business model in order to improve the cryptocurrency space as a whole, which is why I came up with Crypto Saving Expert. For me, it's different. I don't own an exchange. I don't work for an exchange. I use exchanges and I tell people how to use exchanges, but ultimately, it's more education focused. And, and I think that with a lot of exchanges, what exchanges tend to do when it comes to education is tell you how to use the exchange. They tell you how to trade. They tell you what to buy. And for me, this is not always the most productive use of education. The most productive use of education is telling people how to make the best decisions over a long period of time. And for me, I just basically put my entire brain onto a website and give it away for free with the sole purpose of where an exchange has got to make profit, I don't have to. I don't have shareholders to impress. There's nothing to me that is in... I don't care about profit. I made my profit in the bull run. There is no 
I don't care that much. So there is a lot of profit focus within these businesses, which I think to some extent can be predatory. It's not always the best for the market. You see an exchange, ultimately even exchange, invest in something. They have to sell that investment at some point in time. And that is damaging to the industry because when an exchange invests in something, it can, and I'm not having a go at anybody, because I, I, I mean, I'm an investor as well, I do sell things. Um, but the point is, it's, everybody's got to sell, but when an exchange invests, it can be quite damaging to a project, to something like this. Whereas if an investor knows how to see if an exchange is invested in something, to the quantity that they're invested in something, they, and, and they can understand what vesting schedules are, they can understand how, when the selling is going to take place, then they can best make the decision that is ultimately going to best benefit themselves over the long period of time. So from my perspective, I'm not really profit focused. I'm not really, I'm, I'm more people driven is what I would say. I invented a business to get people to use it without the sole purpose of profit. It's more, it's not a not for profit. We will make money. That's kind of the aim of doing a business, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it is what it is. I don't, yeah, I don't really care about money that much. So it's, it's fine. Yeah, great. Well, thank you for that opinion. I think, um, what interesting what we shared here is that we're kind of summarising the areas that exchanges are having a big impact on the market. But again, from both this side of the stage, we have heard that transparency is really key. So whilst we're driving forward the markets and kind of shaping areas, we also need to make sure that we're being transparent to the users. I think um, a follow-up question, I guess, uh, Diego, you mentioned um, incentives and tokens, and I'd kind of like to dig into this a little bit more. Um, would you say the days of incentivized exchange use are behind us or still ahead? Um, and I guess what role could a token really play in sustained growth? Because we have I'll seen a lot of examples of kind of flash in the pan yeah. token incentives. Um, I'll say not at all. I think uh, a lot of uh, DEXs and centralized exchanges are basing their tokenomics around a single token uh, that supports that, that ecosystem as well. Um, I think uh, BNB has made, a, a, again, a pretty strong case uh, uh, building what, what DeFi is today. Uh, so I think uh, we're, we're not, we're not going to see that disappearing anytime soon. Great. James, did you want to, uh, sorry, Jordan, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, I, I quite like exchange tokens. Um, I, that's my thing to add to this, is exchange tokens, I think, are going to be some of the most valuable tokens that you see, because in my opinion, exchange tokens, exchanges are the banks of the future. If you look at, so you have all of these, I want to make a point here, it's not relevant at all to what we're talking about, but cross-chain platforms don't work in the DeFi space. Nobody uses them, no one understands how. Exchanges are the hub for cross-chain transactions because you can send any currency to an exchange and that exchange will accept that currency and then you can swap that currency on the exchange to whatever you need and then send it out again. That's a bank. That's, it's, just, it's, a, it's the centralized hub and exchanges are a good thing. But as we see crypto get more popular, you will see that there are institutions that actually need to onboard onto exchanges and those institutions are going to generate, because currently we've got a lot of retail in the space and retail doesn't have the same money as what an institution does. But when institutions come on board and they need to look at saving fees, they need to look at saving costs, that's when you're going to see volumes shoot up. That's when you're going to see the profitability of the space decline for most participants when volumes are really high. It's like what we saw in the bull market. The higher it got, the less profitable it was. Um, but yeah, with exchanges and exchange tokens, I like them. I think that they are some of the better investments that you can make in the market, just purely based off what I expect future volumes will be and who are going to invest. Like, I can buy a thousand dollars of BNB, I'm not going to make a difference, but if a bank comes in and buys a billion dollars worth of it because they want to save 100% off trading fees or something to make some deal with Binance, look, you support the network and we support you. This volume, everybody wants volume in this market. I don't know if I answered anything there, I just talked. No, that's great, thank you. Um, and I guess this is kind of a question for everyone on the panel. Um, do you think exchanges will move more towards a decentralized or centralized path in the future? I guess regulation may or not play a role in this, but yeah, what's your kind of gut here on the stage? Um, I'll take it. I'll take it because I'm the only decentralized party up here. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you it as well. All right. <laughs> uh, you're in between. <laughs> right, so from our point of view, um, I believe that with regulations incoming and stuff like that, I think there's going to be a merge of the two worlds, which will be the best outcome for everybody involved. Um, for us, um, from our strat strategy point of view on it, is kind of trying to collaborate with centralized parties to basically give the user a safe regulated experience within our decentralized platform. So for our point of view, it's a merge of the two, but from an exchange point of view, they're probably gonna go centralized. But for us, it's all about the community and obviously with a centralized 
kind of um, platform, it's all community driven, right? So we incentivize users with farm token payouts and stuff like that. And then via our roadmap delivery, we go to a, a, a kind of a utility token there afterwards and kind of encourage greater utility on that token where obviously we've got community funds, the centralized exchanges have institutional funds. So we're playing in two completely different markets. So my answer might be slightly different to those guys. Um, I could add something to that. I agree, I agree with you. Um, there is, I think there will be a, a, a world where centralized and decentralized exchanges will work together. And in fact, it's already happening at a large scale at Binance. And I think uh, what will happen in the future is exchanges like Binance will uh, start to be more of an infrastructure provider uh, like traditional um, exchanges today uh, to decentralized exchanges in the future. Of course, uh, KYC requirements uh, might, might play a big role into how many of these decentralized exchanges will prevail during the time. Um, but I think, um, I think we'll, we'll, be, we'll still be here supporting uh, decentralization as well. I think if I can add on that, um, I don't think that the top 10 exchanges out there will somehow become decentralized. That's impossible, as Jordan said. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. Exactly. But you may aggregate volume to decentralized exchanges. We, we already do. So we already have liquidity providers for many DEXs and, and infrastructure providers like custody, loans. So we, we provide all those services to DEXs already. Yeah, I know. And, and that's exactly our point. We will remain centralized, but we will we start working with the centralized exchanges, the third party actors that will provide the most secure environment for our users. And I think that there is something key here. Centralized exchanges have realized that traders out there want two things. They want the security of trading in a, of, of trading an exchange with the returns of the EFI. So those will be the key products. And uh, as uh, Diego said, those products are being structured right now. And we are partnering with the centralized um, institutions. You should right partner with Crypto Saving Expert. We will. <laughs> so Please. yeah, it's, it's happening. We're already structuring those products. And if you go to Binance, if you go to Huobi, you can see that there there are those dual type of products already that still need to work, but we're getting there. Yeah, I mean, so, so from the perspective of, of the exchanges, especially the operators of the exchanges, we're, we're kind of thinking about one, you know, how, how do we hedge against these many different plausible regulatory pathways that, that we could go down? And two, like, are we actually solving customer problems? Um, and it, it's a weird industry because there's a gigantic amount of venture capital that will flow into pretty much any conceivable pathway. And what's going to play out is that every single pathway will be very well executed on with a lot of capital. And the different paths are roughly at the sort of maximally centralized end of the spectrum. Essentially, you know, a lot of exchanges are sort of, tr you know, transforming into sort of, you know, f like neo banks, effectively, like regulated tightly, trying to get regulatory capture over small individual markets, and being extremely restrictive and not really servicing the customers' needs, but just basically just being a retail bank, but with better UX and maybe some exposure to crypto projects. Um, and I, I think we'll see quite a few existing crypto changes kind of go that way. Like, there will be some that do that. Um, and then next to that, you have the sort of model where, yes, it's broadly global, but there is individual pockets of sort of licensing. Um, and that's sort of what's dominating now, and that will probably continue to dominate because that's where pretty much all the liquidity goes. I think it's Diego and, and, and the rest of them observed, right? You know, you will get liquidity on DEXs, but where that really actually gets settled is on these centralized exchanges where it's actually extremely efficient fundamentally, because it just really doesn't work to hedge that venue across the DEXs, not remotely. Um, and, th and then, you know, you will continue to see these, these DEXs. Um, many will try to build the sort of layer ones or possibly layer twos on, on other chains and do that with their tokens. Um, that makes sense. I think as Diego alluded to, like you want to be, the exchanges transform into being the infrastructure layer of the decentralized exchanges. Uh, and then, you know, the final end of the spectrum is centralized exchanges basically just porting over all the technology with varying levels of decentralization in terms of custody, where matches truly get executed and so forth. And we, uh, most, you know, major exchanges are doing some, probably all of the above, more or less. And so it's all being executed upon. <laughs> I have a question for kind of the exchanges, which is when you kind of do liquidity provision, on a, on a decentralized exchange, what you have 
is basically a liquidity pool that's provided by a community. And then people dip in and dip out, they pay a fee and the community gets that fee as interest rates. Is there any kind of product similar on any of your exchanges which, which a user puts up their liquidity and you act as a centralized DEX essentially that allows the user or alternatively, no, I mean, that works perfectly. You're providing liquidity to a pool, but on a centralized platform, it makes no difference. So, so that happens. There are, there are plenty of like existing centralized exchanges that basically offer AMMs on the platform, and there are algorithms that just execute that. The other thing that happens is a lot of earn slash staking products are really just being dumped by the exchange into these liquidity pools on the DEXs. That's where a lot of the capital is really coming from, where the yield, in quotes, is coming from. It, it is risk-taking, but it's one of the highest capacity forms of yield. It's, it's just interesting that... There isn't, I just think it would be a really popular product if you made it so easy. Because the staking yields on centralized platforms are so much lower than they are on... But on it's going platforms. directly into the decks. I, they're, they're, they're taking the spread. Yeah. Right? I, they're taking the extra between the two. Of course. Of the, course. the other mechanic is that they're taking the customer deposits and lending them out to the market making firms. And they're doing the more sophisticated parts of liquidity provision on DEXs when it's not just pure AMM. Uh, and that's an even bigger yield because the sophisticated market makers are much better able to provide liquidity than an AMM algorithm. It's that on steroids, if you like. So I have a question then for all three of you. It's not again relevant, but I want to know, do any of you yourselves, where, where, how do you make passive income from your holdings of cryptocurrency? Do you use on centralized or decentralized exchanges like all three of you, which ones do you use? So, so, so we have a firm separation between these things. We, we don't ever want to touch customer deposits you and use them yourself. in that way without them very explicitly permissioning us to do that. Like, we don't think anyone should be doing that. Although it is abundantly clear that that happens a lot. Um, we have a separate asset management arm, which manages cash from, you know, like genuine trillion dollar institutions, um, small companies of certain niche that, that we dominate in. Um, and increasingly family offices, where we essentially do that as a service. And so it's extremely upfront, the risk management is very clear, and you know, where, where you had things like, you know, exchanges I won't name, punting money into Anchor, and then Anchor depegging, and then, you know, but sorry. You perhaps. yourself, do you use decentralized or centralized? We do a mixture, right? No, you're not we, you. Our asset management team will do a mixture, but it won't do it with custom deposits. Answer the question. Just is it you? Do you use decentralized or centralized exchanges to yield? Yeah, we'll put in both. I mean, not we, you. What do you do with your money? <laughs> sorry, with, with our own cash? No, not, not you, with your own money. What do you Me do? Me, personally? Yes. Sorry, the you here is like, is it Globe? Is it me <laughs> as, a, as a guy? What do I do with my money? I put in our own asset management team because okay. it's amazing. Yeah. And you? <laughs> Um, well, good question. I'll put it on Bitcoin and Ethereum. So do you yield or decentralized or centralized? I do not. No. You don't yield? I you leave it on, okay. on a de decentralized wallet called okay. Storage Solution. Okay. And yourself? Yeah. I yield in Huawei directly in our state. That's products. the correct, that's a company line answer. That's the one you meant to give. <laughs> I might just grab slightly back just so to make sure we're on time. Uh, I wanted to uh, just jump into, well, thank you, that was a very useful conversation. And thanks for helping with the moderating. Um, I think uh, you guys mentioned futures and derivatives, and I think it might be interesting to kind of just jump into this slightly. Um, what do we see the kind of role, I guess, of crypto derivatives in tomorrow's market? Uh, James, I don't know if you want to hop in first. I mean, yeah, so let's start by looking back a bit, right? Spot markets were fantastically liquid but before derivatives really kind of became a thing. And now, you know, there's pretty liquid spot markets for most chick coins, frankly. And that's good. That's nice. The past few years, we've seen this kind of somewhat toxic behavior around the venture aspect where I think we kind of discussed exchanges fundamentally buying tokens on spot or massively discounted prices, running perp and spot and then potentially accumulating short positions to try and hedge out those seed allocations, which I think is one of the key things that will probably start changing with a lot of community pressure around that just being a really bad practice. Um, what's gonna happen going forward is we'll see more kind of synthetic dollars kind of pooling together liquidity. Um, we'll see more unified margining, um, just far greater efficiencies on those fronts. I think, you know, we, we rolled that out well over a year ago, and now Binance has BUSD as of last week, and Binance is now increasingly doing unified margining as well. And so that, that, that'll spread industry-wide pretty quickly, because it's, it's just a superior model. Um, I think we'll see more exotics. Um, they'll happen probably on the DeFi side first, particularly kind of, you know, strategy as a service type assets. They emerged a little bit like five years ago and just never really saw any liquidity. 
But increasingly, you know, strategies of service like trying to capture funding rates, all this kind of stuff, will see some kind of allocation. Um, so, where we see the future of derivatives, uh, I think that goes is going to be highly relate, correlated to how regulation plays out. Um, we have seen, I mean, these are sophisticated products that are not meant to do to be used by the average uh, trader. So, we we do already act as a regulate regulated entity. However, these are not regulated in a sense that it's a crypto product. Uh, but still, derivatives uh, are highly restricted across Europe and uh, across the. America as well. So um, I think for, for thinking about the future, we'll, we'll have to think about the regulation as well. Um, I do think that futures market is still in its infancy, it's still in very early stages, but the products are there. Uh, of course, um, as uh, James said, there is still a long way to go. Um, coin marginated futures, we still have a long way of, of different type of coin marginated futures that we can offer. Um, but we still need, as Diego said, um, that regulation moving forward because the top 10 exchanges right now, we can still not offer futures for retail in, in Europe. So that barrier needs to be overcome first. Um, institutions and also think that the, Q, the future of crypto derivatives will also be uh, pivot for institutions. The, the, as I said at the start, 80% of our clients are choosing futures, choosing UOB futures. So I do think that more traditional investors would choose futures are as the main product, as the main bridge to crypto. Um, I do think they pr um, play a pivotal role, uh, but as Diego said, regulation must evolve accordingly. Uh, I've traded on all of these exchanges, and I quite like trading on all of these exchanges. They're all good exchanges. Um, but from my perspective, my, my question is, well, if the question is where are derivatives going in the future, I'd like to address the UK government directly and say, why did you make a moronic law that bans crypto derivatives in England, and yet you allow people to apply 700x leverage on the forex markets? Are you delusional? Or are you just accepting bankers' money? It doesn't make any sense. The way that crypto futures are uh, regulated in the UK, it's pathetic. And the people for the, that regulate this stuff, they don't understand it, which is why it's important that Binance and, and Huobi, and I assume Globe as well, are not just because- oh, I know we've talked to the regulators. Yeah, yeah, you need to speak to these guys and tell them to stop being so f stupid with the way that they put forward these stupid laws banning people from doing things and yet you can walk into a casino any time of day and lose your entire life savings, take out a million pound loan against your house, lose your house as well, everything's gone and yet crypto derivatives are dangerous, it's ridiculous. The people delusion. Yeah, you can look. I've lost millions of dollars trading crypto derivatives. I've made millions of dollars trading crypto derivatives. You make and lose money. The point is in a casino there is one winner. An exchange takes a fee. The exchange is not the winner if, if you're trading against the exchange. So my question is where they're going in the future. Hopefully, Liz, hopefully you do a good job on this one. And Matt was here yesterday. Matt pledged his allegiance to the crypto flag. We'll see how that goes. Um, but when it comes to Liz, she seems more forthcoming on pro-crypto regulation. And hopefully the big exchanges can have a word to reverse what is an ultimately delusionally stupid law. And that's my point. Good. Great, thanks guys. Um, nice strong opinions there from everybody. Uh, I think probably just because of time, what we'll do is um, I'll come to each of you individually, um, maybe we'll start with you Lee, uh, to summarise what your exchanges are focusing on for the next year and what you think will have the biggest impact in 2023. Um, well, for us, it's all about the seamless, seamless user experience for us, so um, we're heads down deep into development to tr kind of create this journey for the user where they don't even think that they're touching cryptocurrency, it's one click of a button um, and they have their assets, they can go cross chain um, and then basically we want to work with regulated partners to enable it to be a safe environment um, for all our users. So that's what we're looking to do personally. Over to you. Uh, I can take that. So I think um, from Binance perspective, we have been b very focused on growing and building our product base. Um, I talked about earlier about the mar NFT marketplace as just one of, of the of the products that we've been building and successfully. Uh, but from an institutional side, uh, I think uh, we're building a really strong case in infrastructure provider. So custody is a, is a big focus right now. Lending, like I said, um, as well as brokerage services where we provide liquidity to brokers 
in the traditional markets like FX and as well into um, community brokers as well where we incentivize them to bring uh, customers to Binance. So um, that keeps growing. I think for, to, for next year, we'll see those products really, really taking uh, 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 a rocket. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, let me, let me just start off by talking in industry-wide the sort of themes for the next year. So, so I expect to see some intensification of mergers and acquisitions. I think a bunch of the 2018 venues are just going to exit, and you'll see them probably go to private equity or some other means of just kind of cashing out or tokenizing the, uh, the core kind of revenue streams. Um, I think there's a lot of action on the compliance side, so you'll probably see more separation of prop desks from exchanges. Um, You'll see declines in leverage levels offered. You'll see acquisitions occurring of sort of smaller regulated sub-entities. Um, yeah, I, I think that's kind of the key, the key stuff. For, for us, I mean, so we're, we're working on mobile. Um, we actually, I suppose, came a little bit late to the game, but we're a much younger exchange, so <laughs> that's, not the, that's not what you do day one. You build out the rest, that starts to work great, then, then, then you build mobile. Um, the current apps, they feel sluggish. It's hard to get the trades in the one. Just doesn't feel great. And so we, we think we're getting better on that. We'll see. <laughs> uh, we're building out a risk engine. Um, you know, there's been a lot of issues with Jitter in the space recently. That, that's actually another compliance matter. Um, you know, I, I think we've, we've always been pretty great on, on performance, API response time, stick to trade, uh, that, that kind of stuff. Um, but how we manage liquidations, how we manage the kind of insane price action that, that you see over these FOMC announcements, like that really needs to get a lot better. There are these incredibly tight correlations now between the US equities markets and, and, and between pretty much all cryptos, and which have evolved massively, in, in fact, over the last year. And so the way market makers and other participants react in that moment needs to be better managed by the exchanges. They can't just start dumping out certain types of people because they don't want to let them trade. <laughs> when, when those events occur, that's not fair. Um, so that, that will definitely improve. Um, I think, oh, sorry, as another industry point, I mean, there, there are certain things that exchanges have tried to do and have not gone as well as they would have liked. Certainly, Binance has, has done great on NFTs, but I think a lot of other exchanges have, have not, candidly. Like, they've launched their NFT marketplaces and we'll just take another punt at it. I, I suspect that'll happen. I think AMM, uh, NFT products, are, are very interesting and exchanges will probably give that a shot. Um, but it's, you know, it's not as easy as they like to think. <laughs> I, I think... Um, There'll be a lot happening on the options markets. It's traditionally been a very low kind of revenue driver for anything, but lots of exchanges who have taken a punt at options once or twice will probably take a third punt. I'm not particularly confident they'll do better this time, but if they can integrate well with a kind of one or two core flow sources of, of options, they'll, they'll do okay, maybe. At least there's one I can think of that I think is going to start capturing some real options market share. Um, I think a lot of us are starting to think about different customer segments. So most exchanges say, okay, we, we need to win over Zoomers, younger customers, like 18 to 25 plus market. And actually a lot of that is, there's not that much overlap in terms of what they're trading and how they're thinking about the markets. It is quite disjoint. A lot of it is going on these sort of, you know, Magic Eden, Solano place places. And that's where they're kind of trading their meme coins. They're not trading meme coins on a, sorry to say, Globe, Hobby or, 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 or Binance. Um, and so there, there needs to be more innovation serving, serving them. Um, I think there will be more exotic products, some aimed towards businesses that are not being well catered for at the moment. Um, so we, we worked on VIX futures, but that's something that's really hard for market makers to service. And so we'll be redesigning, tweaking those products so they can, they can serve them better. Um, and just in general, we'll be massively expanding our product range and our asset management services. I have a question really for all three of you, uh, just with a short answer, and this one's a bit more friendly. <laughs> it's a bit more friendly. Now. It's a bit more friendly. Is this one? Um, it's more to do with NFTs, because one of the things that put me off NFTs, and I, throughout the entire bull run, mostly ignored the NFT market because they are, for the most part, pictures, and I prefer altcoins because altcoins are pictures without the picture part. They're essentially the same thing. They're all just a useless token, unless it has utility, um, and I feel like NFTs are not they're really the best at holding their utility because they don't have the volume in general to keep up in order to generate that fee in order to pay the business in order for it to make enough money. Now, has anybody come up with a liquidity provision solution that you could drop an NFT into the market and just sell it? Because the problem with NFTs seems to be there is no liquidity for an NFT to sell into. 
Um, and it's more of a question of, have you thought about this? Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so, so we've literally had designs to put NFTs into our unified margining service for some time. So you take your NFT, we quote like a value at it, and you can trade that as futures collateral. Um, the reason why we've avoided launching that so far is because a lot of the demand is mostly, I want to dump this donkey JPEG I don't want anymore, right? And so that's something we have to be a little cautious about, as uh, you know, given the constraints we have. Uh, AMM models for NFTs do exist. They are decent, but I expect to see a lot of improvement in the next year. And for Binance? Um, from the marketplace perspective, I think the, the volume was mostly driven by play-to-earn NFTs yeah. uh, on this BSC is, is quite popular. Out. So it seems to be what bringing that volume to Binance Marketplace. Uh, in terms of um, infrastructure or how, the, how do we provide liquidity for these NFTs, uh, Binance has no play on it. Probably be a, a question for the BNB organization. It's, it's a complex question. And for Hobby? I will keep it short. We, our NFT department is a very early stage. We're yeah. full have an institutional strategy for at the moment we're not jumping into non-fungible tokens. Yeah, I think Great. it's interesting. For me, uh, all my NFTs Jordan. dumped into the toilet, so who cares? You know, they're all worth nothing. But yeah, yeah so I'm just going to have to wrap up because we're slightly overrunning now. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you guys for a great conversation. I think probably just scratched the surface of the kind of impact that exchanges have and also the kind of future of exchanges. Uh, interesting to hear what you guys are all focusing on for the next year. Um, and I guess great to see the kind of collaboration that's there, at least in spirit, if not it, um, kind of applied everywhere yet between centralized and decentralized exchanges. So thanks, guys. Great conversation. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you.